Council for February 5th, 2019. Um, and the first item on our agenda is a closed session. Um, I would look for a motion at this time. Uh, can you say what it's regarding? <laughs> Strategy session to discuss the purchase, exchange, or lease of real property, including any form or water right or water shares, if public discussion of transaction wouldn't. Second. And security. security. Okay. Did, Third. Do you, do you accept that amendment accept to your that. motion? Okay. Uh, second. Yes. Second. You can't second it because you just made the motion. Third it. Um, Wait, I thought James made the motion. I'll make this. Yeah. I'll make you, made, the he, you made the motion. He amended it. Someone second. James second. Oh, Amy seconded it. All in favor? Aye. 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 Oh, I need to roll call this one. Amy? Yes. James? Aaron? Yeah. Yes. Andrew? Yes. And I'm a yes. We're in closed session. We will be uh, reconvened uh, in about 45 minutes. So. Gentlemen behind John. So if you're not here. At 4.30. So anybody who is uh, not supposed to be in the session, thank you for uh, humoring us uh, during our short closed session. Um, we are going to skip uh, the second item on our agenda, uh, which was a budget amendment number three for fiscal year 2018-19. So we'll move to uh, item number three on the agenda, which is budget amendment number four for fiscal year 2018 in 2019. Uh, ben Ludke from the council office um, is here and, I'll, and he can start and then I think, yeah, there's Director Reberg, uh, and Mary Beth, I saw Mary Beth, there, but, oh, there's Mary Beth. And Melissa's not here, but uh, <coughs> Director Reberg is, so. So Ben, when you're ready, I'll let you uh, introduce this. This is budget amendment number four. And before I dive into the details, uh, Mary Beth has an update on revenue from the increased sales tax that was passed as part of the annual budget last year. So first I wanted you all to know that we've only received two months worth of um, the half, half a percent sales tax. So it's in its infancy stage. Um, it is coming in better than projected. Um, next month is going to be our key. December revenues, which are December, we received those at the end of February. So I guess this month. <laughs> so the end of February is going to be a huge dictator on how the revenues will continue to come in. But it looks like we'll probably be on two months worth of revenue, about $500,000 above budget on the additional half percent sales tax. So that's good news. Yeah. No, that's great news. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> okay, um, David, from now on, all administrative head staff has to start with good news like that, so. So the timeline is a briefing today, a public hearing on February 12th, and potential action on February 12th. The council has expedited this budget amendment. There are two items. The first item is the Federal Employee Emergency Loan Program, which is a request to use $100,000 from general fund fund balance. The program would provide one-time no interest loans to federal employees who live or work in Salt Lake City or at the three city airports, including the one in West Jordan and the one in Tooele Valley. The administration estimates that the program would be able to provide loans to 60 to 75 families. The maximum loan would be $1,500. The loan does not have a credit check and it does not have any fees attached. There's typically an application fee for loans from the city. The repayment would be due three months after the applicant receives their back pay or the shutdown ends. This was developed during the shutdown. There is a risk that the government might shut down again on February 15th, depending on Congress passing and the president signing a new budget. The repayment, if it was not received, 
it could be sent to debt collection or it could be treated as a grant. So it would be forgivable and it would not be repaid under that scenario. There are several eligibility requirements that are listed in the transmittal and in the staff report. There is also a limit that applicants need to be less than 100% of the area at or less than 100% of the area median income. And this is calculated based on the number of persons in a household. There's a table in the staff report which outlines those limits which are set by HUD each year. The program would also, per city code chapter 2.44, conflict of interest, it would prevent elected officers, relatives of officers, as well as city employees who work on the loan program from applying. There is a caveat mentioned in the transmittal that the ethical rules and guidelines vary between federal departments and agencies. So any federal employee who chose to apply to this program, the onus is upon them to make sure that it does not violate the ethical standards of their employer. Council staff made a quick estimate of the number of federal employees in the city. We estimate it's over $1,000 excuse me, over a thousand federal employees. And this is because of the multiple federal employers in the city, not just TSA agents at the three airports, but also the federal courthouses, the Securities and Exchange Commission, the Federal Reserve Branch from San Francisco, and a few uh, federal office buildings. Ben, I'm sorry, did you just say that we estimate there's a thousand federal employees working in Salt Lake City, regardless of where they reside? Correct, over a thousand. And is there a way for us to know how many of those reside in Salt Lake City? Not that I'm aware of. So, but we would be receiving um, information on their uh, residents, right? On their, their application. Mm -hmm. So I just have to, I feel like we should prioritize Salt Lake City residents who are also federal employees mm. because I think that this um, could easily be gone before all it, it's a hundred thousand with a fifteen hundred dollar limit right so we could we could liquidate all that money and not have reached all one thousand hypothetically but I, I would like us to contemplate a, a place of residence prioritization for salt lake city residents but i'd love to hear what you guys think not to exclude non-residents but to prioritize, prioritize. right Mm -hmm. That's what I was going to suggest as well. My other question is, during the furlough, do we have any idea how many, did, was there anybody from the uh, federal government that reached out to the city looking for loans? And how many of... No, 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 I'm sorry, no. There wasn't anyone that reached out. But we know there's a demand for it, how? Um, so, if, if I may, Chair Rogers. Um, Temp. Temp. <laughs> <laughs> um, so... See, it's already we, over. Yeah. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed that small <laughs> time of power. Um, we, don't, we don't know. We don't know what uh, the need was other than, um, and that's kind of why we put a cap on the AMI, and I do want to raise a couple policy questions for your consideration on that. Um, uh, we know that um, by the length of uh, the, the, the previous um, government shutdown, and some information that we were able to gather in terms of wages. Um, particularly, we did some looking into like TSA. Obviously, this is broader than just TSA, but that was one area that we were particularly, particularly concerned about um, because the importance of the, of the TSA at the International Airport and, and uh, the South Valley Airport and Tooele Airport um, to maintain safety. Um, and so, um, so we looked a little bit at what their wages were and felt that if we just looked at that, that, that could, the, the length of the government shutdown could present some financial challenges, fiscal challenges for, for the families. But we did not have anyone in particular um, reach out looking for a loan. Where I was nodding my head was where I thought you were going to ask is initially, and part of the delay in not getting this, um, before, we actually had the transmittal ready to go the day the shutdown ended. Um, staff was amazing and did tremendous work. Um, initially, when we first were talking about this, we reached out to TSA to, to find out about eligibility and interest. 
and we are initially told that federal employees would not, uh, or TSA employees would not be eligible to receive this loan from the city. Um, uh, I think two or three days later, we were actually contacted again by an attorney uh, with TSA, um, re-engaging and helped us figure out a way. And that's why you see it's kind of separated into two different categories, including all the airports and then all other federal employees um, in order to do it. So that was some of the, that's where I was not in my head where I thought you were going in terms of the contact. Um, Mr. Chair, if I could also maybe address Council Member Mendenhall's um, issue. Um, definitely a policy call and we can definitely look at placing that kind of priority in terms of residents. Um, where I would say we would want to be careful with that was, again, where we kind of started thinking um, in particular about TSA employees. Um, that was one area, not to, we weren't obviously being exclusive to TSA, but that was one area that we were particularly interested in making sure because of the importance to the city and that they're being furloughed, uh, having to work. Um, and that would be the one concern that we would have about placing a residence requirement, because we know that the TSA employees come from across the valley. Yeah, and I, actually, when I look at my notes on the subject, <clears throat> I was hoping to change that language to, um, a, and I understand functionally also that we want to get this money out as fast as we can, because the families obviously have been in need for a long time now. Um, and they're back at work and that repayment thing, right, has already kicked in because unless it shuts off again on the 21st. Um, but if we could prioritize Salt Lake City residents who are federal employees or who work at a Salt Lake City airport. Does that feel like it might capture yeah, it? Yeah, that might capture yeah, it. I will, yeah, I will tell you that I heard um, as we were getting closer to the end of the shutdown that um, the big concern for TSA workers were daycare, right? Um, people, um, mortgages were being very forgiving, car loans were being very forgiving, but daycare was one area where they were feeling significant pinch because daycares were not being very forgiving. So that is something to consider when so you look at TSA workers. How could to that work? work? Could we say that the first 48 hours of loan availability? are for this um, specific demographic and then after 48 hours we open it because I don't mean to delay no, the access. I, I mean, I th um, I, we can look at that, but I think the way that you're stating it um, gives us some um, guidance um, with okay. that. And so we could take Great. a look at that and, and let you know. Um, Mr. Chair, if I could also just say that one, one other policy um, question that does impact how far the dollars go is the AMI. And when we initially drafted, um, our initial drafts of this uh, proposal actually limited it, limited it at 80% AMI. Um, I became concerned about the 80% the longer the government shutdown went. And so we were creeping into day like 32, and I said, my gosh, even 100% AMI, maybe we should kick that up. Because we, in some, in some ways, we're talking about um, being proactive in case there's a, a, a shutdown, that is something that we can consider uh, whether to do 100% or start with 80%. And the impact would be, you know, the, the dollars could go a little bit further. You'd be limiting the eligibility a little bit, but the dollars could go a little bit further. So I just wanted to raise that because we initially were talking about 80%. I won't touch it. You don't touch it, okay. <laughs> so, has, uh, have we talked about the difference between a loan program and a grant program? So, it's the intent, the, okay. So, the intent is that the loans we be paid back. Haven't you haven't discussed it. it. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, maybe, uh, you know, talk a little bit about why. Um, you know, the, the administration went with the loan route versus the, you know, the grant route. Um, well, my <clears throat> my best guess on that, I mean, A, we probably, uh, we didn't even have that conversation, but my best guess on that is we were looking at gap funding, right? We were anticipating that 
uh, at some point the government shutdown would end and that there would be that back pay. Uh, and so uh, that's why we went the loan route. That is just that gap financing and that the expectation that it would be paid back. Um, the other way, if you did a grant, would have to do a public benefits analysis yes. because these are all private individuals. We'd have to do individual public benefits analysis for every single grant. So just so you're aware, that is one of the issues in us doing a loan. Mr. Chair. I do remember that conversation. Okay. So, <laughs> so we did have that let's, conversation. let's say that a loan does go out to an individual and they default on that loan. What do we do? What's our that, recourse? That is precisely my concern. Mm -hmm. so What's you. that recourse? Because to me, it's not a fair use of taxpayers' dollars to give to somebody in essence that we are guaranteeing them that they will pay it back and then just say, hey, I'm sorry, it's a grant. We're going to write it off. Um, so it will go through the collection process just like all civil collections do now. Okay. So the exact same civil collections process, um, this will be managed through ACT, which is where all civil is at this point in time. We can set payment plans up for these individuals, work with them, you know, to get it paid back as much as we can. So I'm actually going to disagree. So I was thinking that we were on the same page, but I think we're on opposite <laughs> pages now. So the, that is precisely the concern that I have, that, you know, we have um, employees who were the employees of the federal government who were victimized during the shutdown. We then grant a loan um, to help them, you know, fill the fill that gap and depending on what happens we may end up going after them through collections and everything else which means that they're victimized again i mean i i don't know i it's i understand that you know it's tough both ways you don't want to i mean it would create it would be a logistical nightmare to, to do the grant program for the reason that you're talking about but it concerns me that i don't know um, Councilman, if I yeah, Councilman or uh, uh, David. I almost applied yeah. for the di for yeah. the district four. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> might have been a conflict. It might have been a conflict. Um, uh, Director Reberg was just whispering in my ear that um, we appreciate. I mean, your comments dead on, and there's there's a choice that that we make there. Um, but the the point that Director Reberg was making is that with unemployment for the federal workers that was the same situation so if federal workers would have accessed unemployment during the shutdown then they were going to be asked to pay back as well so okay there's some consistency there but would it be safe to assume that the city is going to work with any uh, person who is working to pay it back yes okay absolutely all right other questions andrew just a technical question i, I like what we've gone with this and i appreciate all that um are you planning on factoring the AMI based on Salt Lake City levels or where they are currently residing? It didn't specify in here. I assume it would be Salt Lake City, but. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Thanks. Council Member Mendenhall. Um, could I propose a straw poll just for clarity on the prioritization of uh, federal employees who are Salt Lake City residents or who work at a Salt Lake City airport? Absolutely. Um, so are you all clear on, on that straw poll? Okay, thumbs up. You, oh, yeah. When you say Salt Lake City, you mean owned by Salt Lake City? That's right. Okay, I don't mean you. limited to the Salt Lake City airport. Okay. So all of those in favor of that uh, the straw poll um, prioritizing Salt Lake City residents, um, thumbs up. And that is unanimous. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, if, yes. I, if I may, there's there's one other policy um, question that I'd love to throw out for um, direction from the council. Um, and I apologize, this actually just came up um, this last weekend. Um, one of the gaps that we uh, saw during the shutdown and the, the payback is the contract workers. Um, right now, the way that this policy is written and the loan program is written, it would not apply to contract workers. It would only apply to federal employees. We've, we've spoken internally about whether to um, um, extend that, and we could create uh, some, the criteria would be a little bit different, or not the criteria, but the, um, the application process may be a little bit different of what we would, um, but I wanted to raise that and get your feedback on that. Um, that is, um, the case I would say for doing that would be that those are typically the most um, low-wage workers 
um, so that if we were to have another government shutdown, um, they would be impacted. I would just add for the council, for the council's consideration, one of the difficulties with uh, extending this type of a program to contract workers is they are not guaranteed back pay, whereas federal workers are guaranteed back pay regardless if they work the hours during a shutdown. Okay, so uh, do we know, uh, so in your, in the work that you've done, how much, or how many contract uh, workers would you say would be impact, or were impacted during the oh, shutdown that's a, versus um, that's a great question. federal employees? Do you know that answer? We don't, we don't know that. We could try and find that out, but I'm, okay. I'm not sure how we, I mean, we could, we could try and find that out. So the proposal that's in front of us right now, though, just to be clear, is just the loan program for federal, federal employees. employees. Correct. Um, one of the things that I, so I would be very interested in seeing what you come back with. Um, a, a plan proposal for contract employees, but one of the things that um, we may want to look at just because of the nature of those contracts, you know, the contract employee work is, is substantially different than federal work. We may want to look at the loan program versus, or not or the, the grant program versus the loan program because they don't, those workers won't have the ability um, to repay the loans using some of the back pay. So, so I understand that that's going to create a more, you know, a, a much more logistical job. But at the same time, you know, these are the employees that would would have a tougher time anyway. Councilmember Mendenhall, I'm wondering if it might be easier to do a loan forgiveness clause, it's just to avoid the individual public benefit analysis of potentially hundreds of people. Where do we, where do we, do, if we go in with a loan, knowing that we're going into a program with loan forgiveness, does that, that doesn't? I think we'll have to follow up on that. I don't know that that's, that that's enough for this because each individual person is a private individual. Um, hmm. I don't know that a loan forgiveness, but we can follow up. Can I? Yeah, so. Um, one thing, and I don't know if um, our attorney who's present would know off the top of her head, but the attorney's office told us that one of the values in having this be part of a budget opening is that the fact that it's advertised as a budget opening means that you don't have to have a separate public hearing. So there's some possibility that um, because of the way it's being done, it might not necessitate all those public benefit hearings, but we'll check with the attorneys tomorrow, right, together. Okay. Other questions or comments about the loan program for federal workers? Okay. Um, thank you, uh, David, for bringing this to you know our attention immediately. You know when when this came about. Um, you know. Uh, that was a very difficult thing for you know many of our employees, and right now we have so many people working on federal projects in the in the city that have major impact to what we do. Uh, so I appreciate the administration uh, bringing this proposal forward. Mr. Chair, if I could just also yeah. quickly thank administrative staff, Can Hand, Finance, and the Attorney's Office for really rallying around the idea, and to the council and council staff for um, being very open. And, 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 and patient as we are trying to piece something together very quickly. So thank Great. you. Thanks. Okay. Other items, Ben? On uh, one more item and yep. a note on the the item before us. If if the council approves the hundred thousand dollars from fund balance, the remaining fund balance will be at ten and a half percent, and that equates to one and a half million dollars above the ten percent minimum threshold. The one other item in this budget amendment is A2. It is a request to repurpose $20,000 in previously approved contingency funds in the airport enterprise fund. And those $20,000 would be used on gas and food gift cards for airport employees, which are expected to mostly be TSA personnel. That's it for the budget amendment. All right. <laughs> Any other comments from the administration? Okay, thank you all for Great. being here. I had a couple of questions. Hang on here one yeah. second. I just got to find it. Um, here it is. 
James is waiting to ask questions until we're done with the conversation. Well, we had the airport guy show up. Right? <laughs> uh, what is the amount per gift card that we're looking at per? So for the 20,000, we are going to basically. Because I know this is different than what we just discussed. Right. So the way we do it is we would buy $20 increments between gas and food gift cards. We would then turn it over to the field service director assigned to the Salt Lake Airport. For TSA, right? For TSA, he would take those gift cards and he would distribute it not just to TSA, but Customs, Border Patrol, as well as air traffic control. But he would maintain the record of what employees got what gift cards and what amounts. Um, but $20 is a good threshold to keep everybody out of jail. Okay, great, thank you. All right, uh, item number four on our work session agenda today is uh, the Funding Our Future, uh, the Transit Interlocal Agreement with the Utah Transit Authority. Kira, and let's see. Kira, when you are at the table, I will turn the time over to you to introduce this. Uh, ben is here as well. And then Jennifer McGrath, John Larson, and Julianne Sabula from the administration. All right, just to get us oriented, this is part of the Funding Our Future project, which implemented a 0.5% sales tax increase to address the previously unfunded critical needs of safety, streets, affordable housing, and transit. In the fiscal year 19 budget discussions, the mayor recommended and the council approved $5.3 million to improve transit service. 2.8 million of that funding was allocated for the first year of this partnership with the Utah Transit Authority. The council now has the final draft of the interlocal agreement, which governs collaboration between the city and UTA, and the first addendum, which identifies the first routes to be mobilized in phase one, which is not the same as year one, and authorizes the funding to implement it. If approved, the enhanced service would begin August 2019. The addendum authorizes funding for the first year. I'll let the administration speak to the latest updates in these agreements and the next steps for service and these budget allocations. After that, there should be time for questions and answers between the council and administration. And if we still have time after that, I would be delighted to walk through some of the policy questions in the staff report. Thank you. So uh, we did not uh, have a formal presentation. Um, we've presented several times over the over the fall, and um, really just tied up some loose ends. And so hopefully there aren't any big surprises from what you've seen previously. But Julianne's going to give kind of a rundown of um, the the changes in this final draft versus where we were um, when we last spoke about this in December. Great, thank you. Um, so last time we were here, we outlined three items uh, just to, to restate the general frame of the agreement. There's the master agreement, and that's kind of the rules by which we play for 20 years. Then the addenda, which identifies specific mobilization costs in the first year. Um, and then uh, in a future allocation, we'll address the cost of service uh, during the second year. Um, so last time we were here, we had three items that were still unresolved, uh, and those items were inflation rate, uh, cost of paratransit being added to the service, um, and the administrative overhead costs. And all of these related to our cost calculator. It's a spreadsheet that is complex and requires a lot of discussion, but it didn't result in giant changes. The agreement probably looks very, very similar to what you've already seen. Um, there's a few numbers, some adjustments to the exhibits. We also discovered a couple of errors along the way. We checked in with finance just to make sure um, we had everything as we discussed it. Um, <laughs> what's that? Benefit. Oh. <laughs> Um, I don't know, actually. I think us, because our costs came in lower. <laughs> and a, a few typos, those sorts of things where, you know, swap, we, we had some accidental swapping back and forth of exhibit A versus exhibit one sort of stuff. Yeah. 
Um, so we did do a pretty exhaustive exploration of all of the various ways to calculate some of these things. The first two were pretty easy. Administrative costs are always tricky, um, and they're not tracked in as clear a way as some other things are. So that was the one that probably required the most time, but we feel like we really did our due diligence on that piece, um, and I'd be happy to answer um, any questions about that specifically, but obviously any of these items. Um, we, w we did work closely with finance, legal, and then several UTA departments have an interest in getting this uh, right uh, and making sure everything's accurate and will accommodate their needs. Um, we adjusted some ex exhibits to reflect some of the, some of the decisions that we made. Um, and then we added information about the administra administrative costs, and this was primarily for the sake of, of transparency. Um, it didn't really change anything, but we felt like it was a little more clear what it is we're paying for. Um, and then finally we added a look back and really it's because city sponsored transit service increases are new to us, they're new to UTA, we've never collaborated in this way and we're going to learn as we go, we hope. Um, hopefully not by a lot of mistakes but we do want to be able to check in at least every two years until we feel like we've got a really stable smooth running system uh, in place. And. Let's see, I'm trying to think if there's anything else. Oh, and we did give an initial draft of this first addendum um, that will come up in the next uh, budget allocation. So this isn't part of the resolution today that we're discussing, but it is something um, that I think is really key to understanding the agreement and how it will work with service. So did you have anything to add? Yeah, uh, so building on that, um, I think it's just worth noting, and this is something you know, we've mentioned before, but. You know, there's a lot of moving pieces involved with this, but um, what the resolution that we've put before you uh, doesn't actually have the funding for the year one service as the funding for the ramp up costs for that. So uh, in the budget season is when we look forward to working with you on um, the adoption. We have a draft addendum in there. Um, that we can revisit during the budget season that will actually fund year one service. Um, and that's for uh, 2nd South, 9th South, and 21st South. Um, so we think that we could do uh, the 6th North and 10th North service as early as 2021, uh, but that would require including ramp up costs in um, the next fiscal year. So that would um, take it, the, the first three routes that are funded is uh, basically an $8 million total uh, transit program. Adding in 6th and 10th North would bump that up to a $12 million program. So that's something that we're gonna have to talk through in the coming months. The ramp up costs for 6th and 10th North will be $2 million? Um, we, we're working with UTA on exactly what those costs will be um, and we'll, we'll get back to you, but we, we don't exactly know that yet. Okay. Councilmember Mendenhall. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have uh, a few questions. And you're right, there's no big surprises in here. Um, mostly I'm appreciative that we're at this point. Thank you, yeah, it's exciting. Um, so I'm wondering, these are some really good policy questions that Kira has brought up and I underlined many of them. One of them particularly around sponsorship um, and I, I, do, I would like um, to know about whether or not those discussions have be, been coordinated around sponsored fare. And then I want to tag on to the data question number three. If there is, um, if those conversations have begun at all, if there's any data that we can acquire that would aid in um, accelerating sponsorship and <coughs> private investment in the system. Um, I'm processing a little bit the, the question and looking at this policy question uh, in the staff report. So we have been developing a scope of work um, that I think is near final. We had a discussion about it just yesterday uh, in terms of a fair analysis and um, the obstacles to expanding 
our fair programs. Um, but we also have been talking a lot with the development community, for example. We have a lot of cranes in the air and a lot of development proposals in the queue. And so there's a real interest in having, especially in high density housing, transit as a really uh, robust, viable option. Um, both just in terms of promoting those properties um, to potential residents, but also then having people utilize transit uh, and minimize demands on parking. So we have had those conversations with the development community as well. Is that the type of information you're asking about? Yeah, I guess I want to know a little bit. It sounds like the development community is aware of an opportunity. You're aware of an opportunity. What happens next that gets us closer to an expansion of the zone? Um, yeah, the free fair zone expansion specifically, I think that's going to have to be um, really driven by the, the business community and those who um, I think it's the Downtown Alliance that um, covers those costs now. Um, so, and there's uh, always secondary impacts. Uh, it came up in a community council meeting with Central Ninth that uh, at first they were really excited about the thought of it. Um, you know, over the course of the meeting, you kind of saw that arc of enthusiasm of at first they thought, well, yeah, that'd be awesome. Let's ex extend um, down to Ninth South. And then they were saying, well, wait, hold on. Now, does that mean that more people are going to be parking in front of my house and riding transit for free into town? And so there's some of those sorts of conversations that have to happen as well. Um, but then with the broader um, sponsored service discussion, um, it's something that we've been talking about internally and with UTA uh, and others really since last summer. And um, the biggest challenge that I've run into with it is that uh, it's really hard to pin down the options, it just seems to just proliferate because you have some people who think that UTA ought to just um, find a way to uh, have free fare or sponsored fare system wide or maybe county wide. Um, or, uh, you know, there's a lot of developers that are willing to help subsidize fare for their, um, their uh, renters or, um, sorry, landlords that would subsidize for their renters in, in exchange for. Um, not having to provide as much parking, um, or uh, you know, are there ways to have more um, small businesses that can participate? Um, you know, so is there any data collection that we aren't doing that could help advance any of those desires? Um, oh, we'll have to. Can we get back with you on that? Yes, I please. think that's a great question. Yeah, because so. I would love to make specific requests around some metrics that could help us advance okay. those conversations that are important to the business community, important to people in housing, and important to the city. So um, yes, please. Okay. Another one I want to ask about is, uh, actually I want to say that I am not interested in the council reviewing um, 21A46060 for all those People who know what that means. It can, you're. I don't want to put um, advertising on bus stops. Got it. Okay. And I wanted to know what the what attorneys think about the dispute resolution, um, the and the language that currently doesn't identify a mechanism to evolve disputes. That um, that language is, I guess, typically in an ILA. Will you, you need to come up to a mic though, sorry. While she's coming up, Council Member Mendenhall, what if it were to be used with advertising the actual bus routes? Oh, except for us? Yes. That's pretty good. I like you know that. what I mean? Yeah. So we can actually advertise what's going on uh -huh. and the differences that are, these routes are going to make for the neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. yeah. So if we specifically tie it to transportation. Mm, it's got to be more specific. Yeah. I have to come up and talk more about that one. Mm -hmm. Hi, Megan Nepal from the Salt Lake City Attorney's Office. So you asked why the dispute resolution um, language isn't specifically outlined in the ILA. Is right. that correct? For elevated disputes. Yeah. So that language isn't necessarily in every ILA. In fact, I've only seen it in a few that I've worked on. Um, I haven't been in the city for that long, so it might be in a lot more. Um, and part of the problem with that outlining those kinds of dispute resolution processes is that 
committees change, positions change, titles change, and then you end up having to redesignate people, you know, and trying to get your committee to work together. In the case with this relationship, I feel like the the technical groups from UTA and the city are working together constantly. So I feel like most of them are going to be working at that level with those good working relationships to go ahead and just just go ahead and, and resolve those disputes at the lower level and not need to escalate them. And if they do, they each have their own chain of command to do that. So I just don't think it's necessary. It's certainly something if council feels is very important, we could add to the agreement. And I don't think UTA would have too many oppositions to that, but we would have to get their sign off as well. Well, I appreciate that, Megan. And um Sounds like you're going to jump in, oh, John, but I, sure. it brings up my last question, which is how will the city choose our representative? Because that wasn't explicit either. Yeah, and I think for the, the points that Megan just said, and I think it's highlighted by the fact that uh, UTA has had a, a lot of changes in titles and positions over the last year. Um, and so designating specific positions, it can it just kind of becomes cumbersome. but. Uh, what we've talked about is that really the, the points of contact for uh, you know, staff level, technical level dispute resolution would be um, the transportation director for Salt Lake City and the planning director for UTA. I meant, um, I'm referring to item 10 on the public, on the policy questions, which isn't necessarily about dispute resolution, right. but it's about the city's designated representative on the ILA. So oh, I think that would stay the same as well. So um, for ILA issues um, or also dispute resolution issues. So that would be currently that'd be me and Laura Hansen. Okay. Councilmember Johnston. Thank you. Um, first question on the frequent. Nice job, by the way. I'm super excited, as you probably know already. Um, on the frequency discussion, have the school districts and employers been specifically targeted to ask their feedback on the proposals for the number two, the nine, and the 2021? 20, on specifically frequency? Like yeah. how often we run the buses? How often, how late, uh, the balance between Saturday, Monday through Friday versus Saturday and the 15 minute increments, all that kind of thing. Have they been consulted much? How has that happened? Um, so we have in our transit master plan, we have established minimums and that's what we're, we're buying up to that minimum. Mm -hmm. Although if UTA pr chooses to provide more and in the case of the two, they are doing that because operationally it's easier. Mm -hmm. um, they can. And so it'll be the same service Monday through Saturday. Um, and it will run from 5 a.m. to midnight. It'll be every 15 minutes until 7 p.m. and every half hour thereafter. The first hour, I think, is 30-minute service as well, from 5 to 6. Uh, then Sundays, it's 30-minute service from 7 to 7. I ask that because if you look at the chart, it is uniform Monday through Saturday and different on Sunday. But if pl employers and schools have different requirements on weekday nights, particularly past 7 p.m., um, has that been brought up or talked about um, as a question? That come up in the, I don't in the master so. plan discussions? Okay. I, I would so. just ask that maybe be approached at some point. I like the uniformity. It makes it easy to remember and do it. Um, and the half hour increments are frankly better than we have now, period. So I'm not overly concerned. Um, but if this could be tailored a little more perhaps as needed um, to those kind of needs, employment and school particularly, uh, I'd be interested in hearing that. The second, um, somewhere between a question and a concern or a statement, somewhere in there it's going to be, uh, sponsorship is a huge, huge deal, right? Uh, we think we've talked about that we need to help folks get on the bus. The frequency is a huge piece and access to it. Uh, but then what does a hive pass look like? Um, how is that going to look? And so I see in here the 30,000 allocated. I, I don't necessarily see a time frame or a goal or some sort of objective we're trying to get to and what time frame to get this going. Um, so I'd like to see that if, if possible. I know it gets complicated when you get into the weeds, and I appreciate that. Um, but I would like to see sort of, we have a target to get an understanding of when, because if we're trying to isolate factors, right, it's frequency gonna increase our, our ridership, 
when it implements. How much um, is it a combination of that and other factors such as uh, a unified pass or a hive pass or something along those lines? So we can really drill down in some future date with the data and say what bang for the buck helps us get out ridership and people really re re respond to positively. I'm interested in hearing that, so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I can talk a little bit about, um, I hope this isn't too far afield, but mobility as a service is something that we've been working really hard on um, and it's kind of like a hive on steroids. Um, and so, you know, really, in your phone primarily, but um, by a pass, whatever mechanism is available to people that you have your whole suite of transportation options that you can plan and pay for in one place. You can have a subscription, a monthly subscription um, at varying levels. And that's what we're really working toward in partnership with UDOT and UTA. Um, we were unsuccessful in our attempt to get an American Dream uh, Ideas Challenge grant, and so but we are not stopping um, as a result of that. We're charging forward um, with that concept. And so that big picture is sort of the end game we have in mind. In the meantime, um, we've identified a couple of, um, and I am not the person who's an expert on this, so I know in broad brush, um, some things that are really almost internal obstacles related to our own ordinances and practices um, that I think that we can free ourselves up to do more. And that's probably the first thing to knock down um, before expanding. Um, we are, I, I've requested some information about Free Fair Zone and its current cost. Mm -hmm. um, some of the basics that I think will get us started. And then we're interested in initiating a very small contract to get a little bit of consultant help with analyzing this. So okay. does that? Sure, I, I, you know, I'd love a free fair zone, but if we're not going to do advertisements on stops and we're going to go and limit our, our, in, our revenue for this, I don't think it's reasonable. So I'm more interested in making it as easy as possible and um, as cost effective as possible with some personal investment. Um, so I'd be interested in seeing those options and what the cost would be so we can talk about how we may um, find ways to do that. And Council Member Johnston, to your point about the sponsorships, and um, I don't think that, I mean, we haven't had that discussion. I know that Council Member Mendenhall, um, you know, raised the point uh, sure. earlier, but but that has not been a discussion, but I, I'm open to it um, because I, you know, I'm, I would rather see more options, um, you know, and if, if we can do more through sponsorship, I, I'm not at all opposed to it. So <laughs> I think that's a discussion that we can have later. I um, agree with that person. But so, yeah, yeah, but, but yeah, we haven't, we haven't taken a position on, on that. So, okay. so uh, oh, sorry. By me. Um, so something that'd be helpful for us is maybe, um, uh, a, direction from, from the council as far as how, how open you are to kind of rethinking or adding some flexibility to the high pass, maybe expanding it. Um, it sounds like yes. Um, but, you know, so we're talking about things like, you know, could we work with UTA to develop maybe a family pass or uh, for people who only need transit or only ride transit on occasion, like maybe people who are, have committed to only ride on red air days or uh, every Friday or something. Um, so a monthly pass doesn't make sense for them, but maybe um, they could use that same hive type partnership to be able to get a, a fare card charged up that they only use, you know, four times a month, but at least that's better than nothing and they're kind of getting their foot in the door. So uh, what we'd like to do is come up with some things this spring to recommend that we can implement right away and then um, come up with some recommendations for, um, you know, one to five years that we can start chipping away at it. Sorry, that works for, um, you know, what I would like to see. I, you know, for us, I think more op the more options you can, you know, present us, the better. Okay. Um, and, you know, once we have those options, then we can have a more deliberate discussion about, no, we don't want it, we don't want any, you know, bus stop sponsorships um, in the city. We just need to, I mean, it's easy to have the discussion now um, because we don't know what we're saying no to. So I would say present us with options. Um, I, I, this is the first phase. I think this is good, but you know, what I would like to see is, you know, uh, other options. If, if, if sponsorship is something great, if expanding the Hive Pass is something wonderful, let's, let's talk about it. Um, 
one one thing that I would like to do, I don't need to suspend the rules because I don't think it's technically in the rule, but um, our practice is, you know, we usually we don't invite other um, groups to the table, but I know that UTA is here. Um, and if my colleagues would be okay, I would like to invite UTA up for uh, a couple of questions, if Could that's I, okay. I agree with that. Could I say something in yes. response to um, the question about direction from us? Yes. I, I think that we're looking at the frequency very effectively. We're looking at access based on where the routes are in the next two, three phases very effectively. Um, it's that financial access piece that's a question for me still. So your response is, um, I would personally be very favorable to looking at a hive-like concept for city residents that is unifying across multiple platforms, um, is cost-effective for and flexible for families particularly, um, kids, parents, and based on um, not necessarily riding every day, but periodically enough to test it out. Um, and something along those lines, I'd be very uh, supportive of. And then, obviously, the analyzing the cost, right? Um, how do you do that effectively? Because um, I really think the access piece is going to be as simple as possible, reliable, um, so you don't get stranded, <laughs> and I don't waste money. Because um, the folks who are going to probably need this are the ones who can't afford to toss 10 bucks in the trash, right? Yeah. So, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I see Nicole uh, from UTA. If you want to come up to the table while you're making your way up, I know that Councilmember Rogers has a two two questions. Two quick questions. Um, so, 10th North and 6th North. When will the ask be? Do you think for that funding? Um, as soon as we want to do it. So the soonest we feel that we can, um, it, it requires a ramp up phase just like these first three routes. Um, and that would happen, could happen as early as next fiscal year. So we can come to you in the next budget. Um, really with that, those mobilization costs, the following year is when the, the service changes would go into place. Um, it would represent um, that a little over $12 million scenario, and so that's also a discussion, but we do have uh, funding we didn't know about when the last budget was done, so. And then my follow-up question would be the 800 and is it 62,000, whatever it is, um, you would like 20% in the, I wanna call it as a reserve account, right? Or were you looking for more than that? Because right now it sits at 40%. So my question is, what if we dropped it to 20% and you use that funding to put in the bus benches or what we're looking at for the amenities on these routes to help streamline that as well and jumpstart it? Because what we have right now, I think it's what, um, $823,419 that's unallocated. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chair, can I, this is what I wanted to bring up also. Yeah. And I met with the administration earlier today about plans for the HRC communities. Um, and particularly the High Avenue Paramount site has a lot of challenges around accessing transit in the area, simply even by sidewalk. So I was wondering if with that funding, setting up an appropriate contingency and then asking the administration to come back to the council with some proposals how we could use the money for transit investment um, and whether that's bus stops in those areas or what, I don't know, but we've identified quite a few needs in that half mile radius around the HRCs, particularly um, the High Avenue one. So I, I wanna bring that up. Do you wanna propose a straw poll? Yeah, I would like to, okay. that the administration come back to the council with a proposal to utilize um, whatever remaining after a 15% contingency is created from the 823,000 um, excess right now to utilize that remaining funding for uh, prioritization of transit-oriented investment in the HRC communities. Okay. And a little bit in addition, because I think this is also a planning scenario, in my opinion. It, would, it can also look for ways to streamline the processes with these other lines as well. You know, whether they're shelters, bus shelters, or whatever we're looking at. But I, I can see the, the reasoning behind that focusing around the HRCs, but I think there's plenty of opportunity there, not just to focus it there, but to, to broaden it in that aspect. Yeah, this is the year of the HRCs, you know, and mm -hmm. we committed as a council a couple of years ago to making sure that those communities um, that we can do right by them in as many ways as possible. So this is a theme that I think, I hope I'm not the only one raising every time we look at a opportunity to be 
um, intentional and prioritize needs. These are really real needs to really actually ADA needs in that area are pretty significant. So I, I'll bring it up in other regards, but this is an opportunity that um, wouldn't hurt. Just like to piggyback them so they're, they're together. So to look citywide and at HRCs. Well, not citywide, just specifically tied to the roots, whether they're the future phases or current phases, but specifically, I'm fine with it looking at HRC, HRCs primar primarily and then looking at it as well in the same time. So what if, what if we did this? What if staff, if, or not staff, um, you know, transportation, if you can work um, on a couple of the points that the council member Rogers was talking about just looking at, at how to expand and um, do what he's looking for the 1800 or 823,419 minus the 15% contingency per council member Mendenhall's straw poll uh, would then be used um, primarily in the areas around um, the HRCs to deal with some of the transit issues related to that. Um, that way you're getting, you know, we're, we're still keeping the priority moving forward um, on those additional lines or expanding that additional service. But the money that would be, that's in front of us right now could go towards what Council Member Mendenhall was talking about. Um, and then in future years, there will probably be other adjustments that, that, we, can, that we can have. So. Um, to, par to, to rephrase council member uh, Mendenhall's straw poll, it would be uh, allocating the, uh, that remaining money minus the 15% contingency um, and looking at options surrounding the two HRCs uh, to improve transit access, ACA, um, or ADA ability or, ability or accessibility um, issues and anything else. No, I just think transit related because okay. that's what we said. We so that's what the money would be for. And then Council Member Rogers points, you all could work on that separate. Does that make sense? Thumbs up that you support that, thumbs down that you oppose it. Uh, I have a discussion about the 20 versus 15%. Sure. That's my only hang up. Okay. Uh, I'd feel safer with 20% at this point until we know what we're talking about going in the future. And then if it is 15% or whatever we have, I'm fine keeping the rest and doing what we're talking about. Okay. Council Member Mendenhall, would you be okay with the 20% instead of 15% of, in your original motion? Sure. Okay. So it's now at 20% instead of 15%. Thumbs up that we support that, thumbs down that we oppose it. Okay. And that is unanimous. Um, Nicole, so if you want to make room for Nicole. I, I'm because Councilmember Mendenhall gave us a heads up, we actually can speak at least in part to this question if you'd like us to right now. To the HRC need. To the needs, um, the, the 800,000, sure. all of that. Well, if you're, if, to if, no, if you're ready, it, yeah, if you're ready to talk about how you'd spend that money, let's hear some of the ideas. Uh, so I, I would uh, like to, I guess, um, make two points. One is that we uh, we have asked and you allocated uh, over a million dollars for capital investments that um, is available this fiscal year um, that could be used for um, and that we were planning on using for uh, f improving bus stops and first last mile access to um, the, um, the frequent transit network routes. Um, and we, we believe our interpretation of that is that that could include um, everything that's on phase one, including the Rose Park routes. Um, and that's something that we're, we would like to see as um, an ongoing allocation of capital investments so that we can continue to uh, improve the capital, the, um, not only the bus stops, but then the first last mile uh, enhancements um, around all the bus stops on all the frequent transit network routes. And, um, and then the the other point that I'd like to, to make is the need to have uh, a buffer for the uh, um, the operations because that's something that is once we make that commitment that's going to be an ongoing need and um, the prices can can fluctuate year to year as well as as, as revenue um, and so I would recommend building up a reserve of um, probably three to six months worth of um, service 
um, that we are able to put in kind of a, an account that's firewalled just for operations. Um, so that so if we have a downturn. three million dollars once the most we would, routes are added um, as well? Yeah, yeah, so once we are, have ramped up to like a $12 million program, I think you should have about a, a $3 million reserve that is just for uh, kind of a rainy day fund for just operations. Um, and that way, not if, but when we have another recession, um, we're not cutting evening and weekend service, but we're able to kind of work our way through it. One other th I, thing. Oh, sorry. I want to bring something up with that. I would love to have administration come back to us with a proposal. We just heard from Mary Beth earlier that it, it looks like we might have uh, more than we budgeted on the sales tax revenue that's coming in now. I, I would love to hear a proposal for how to, we can, in times of um, more revenue, yeah, plan for the times in need and help set us up for those contingencies. Thank you. Well, we can do that. Um, in addition to being able to utilize the over $1 million that um, was set aside for capital improvements, which we can look at um, some improvements uh, on uh, Third West right away, see how quickly we can move those forward. Um, one of the things we heard very clearly both from the administration and the council was the desire to solidify these routes and make sure that they can go on in perpetuity, that people can count on these routes, they can change their lifestyle based on knowing that these routes will be there. And for us, that is what emphasizes the importance of having a rainy day fund. Um, what we don't want to have happen is we, d we are in a prosperity time right now and so what we want to do is be very forward thinking about revenues may come in differently next year or the following year costs may fluctuate and what we want to do is protect these routes so that the people of Salt Lake City know that they can count on them and we've preserved something on the side to make sure that in hard times um, we do whatever we can to not have to pull back on that great so you know, it is a little bit different that we would have, you know, that I would invite UTA at, but, but the main reason I wanted to do that, and then we'll, uh, if there are questions for Nicole or Nicole, if you have any comments, but really I wanted to thank you um, for, on, uh, you know, on behalf of the council for the work that UTA has done, the collaboration with the administration. I want to thank administrative staff uh, for working with UTA. Um, this is a unique uh, situation that we as a city have not done before. Uh, it's one that has been discussed uh, many different times, but um, you know it's always easier to discuss things conceptually uh, once you actually have to put it in practice and start you know making those ideas uh, come to life. It is much more difficult. So I just want to acknowledge um, all the work that you've done, uh, both from the administration, UTA, um, and you know this is an exciting thing that hopefully we can expand as as we move forward. So uh, with that, do any of you have any uh, questions specifically for UTA regarding uh, these proposals? Okay. All right. Nicole, I'd just you? like to say thank you to the council and the administration. I think this has been um, exciting for us. Um, your support um, with the council and the administration in UTA to do more frequent service to support our community together is a great partnership. We appreciate every one of you using your capital and working with us to make, move this forward. It's going to help both of us and we, we um, we're looking at this as a model to take to other communities and private partnerships to show how we can work together to provide the best service to our community. So we thank you. We love this. This is exciting for us. I get chills when I think about that nine South service. It's it's really important. And um, I would just like to say, um, Council Member Johnston, we did work with the University of Utah and the Salt Lake City School District on those times, making sure that they could do after school programming um, and and. That that frequency work. So we, we did work. This has been a long time coming. So I did want to say that UTA did look at those uh, times with the school district and the U of U, and they are super supportive of this too. So Salt Lake City has done a lot for the community, and we thank you. Great. Well, if there are no further uh, questions, thank you all for being here. Um, oh, Andrew. Yeah, this, this, may, this is not UTA, sorry, Nicole. Um, <laughs> When we talk about transportation related stuff, uh, we may want to look at that a little closer. I, I say that because on the, the Paramount Avenue area, 
with the nine changing routes, there's no bus running on third between 13th and 17th. Um, so doing upgrades there doesn't do much good for us on that street. The big issue, frankly, is more around transportation. Um, and I say that because it's about snow removal in the wintertime, mm -hmm. because it's not, uh, sidewalks don't get prioritized in that area, and it's impossible to get from tracks very effectively anywhere outside of there, and the width of the sidewalks. So it may not be transit specific, the needs in that area. Um, so we may need to talk a little bit about what that means, transportation um, kind of focus for this funding. Um, or find other funding for that. So. Okay, and to, you know, since Council Member Mendenhall missed some of that, but right. no, it's okay. So, you know, what, what Council Member Johnston was talking about is that, you know, we may want to look at some other um, uses for that funding, you know, whether it's, you know, the tra or more transportation based. So if we need to do snow removal, for example, or, or something else, and my guess is that that would fit with what you're talking about. Um, it may not, but I think having that discussion is, you know, keeping it at least open works. Thank you. And I, um, you know, Charlie, you were really a bastion for us sticking to what we said we were going to spend the money on and nothing more. So I, I'm with you on that. And I think come back with whatever your interpretation is of what we said when we uh, decided to do the sales tax increase. and then we can talk about it. Yeah, and we don't, it, 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 there is no intent at all of having a bus stop where there's not a bus. So, um, you know, just, we, we, we know that we don't just want to spend the money, so. <laughs> I, I, I ask that because theoretically what you could be looking at is a study of, of pedestrian patterns in the neighborhood based on that, um, with the, and then figure out from there what the upgrade might be because uh, it could be a little more nuanced and interesting about how we most effectively save, say, Lowe's from being overrun through their parking lot mm -hmm. by folks also tr crossing at the tracks crossing um, instead of at the crosswalks um, because of sidewalk width on 13th particularly. There's some issues in there that may not fit our intent for this money, but we need to find our, in our budget how we would address those because it would affect this. Okay. So, so one, one idea that, that we may want to do, I mean, and I don't think we need to necessarily convene a formal subcommittee, uh, a, a formal council subcommittee, but I would say that if, if there are uh, council members who are interested, I would say council member Mendenhall and council member, member Johnston um, in particular on this issue, if anybody else would like to um, you know, work with the administration and the UTA uh, on, on some of this and how we move forward, um, maybe we can you know, maybe that's a way to do it so that, you know, you're not coming up with brilliant ideas that are different from what, um, what we're thinking. That way everyone's thinking together. Does that work? I like it. Okay. All right. Can I, can I quickly plug two big projects that are in the pipeline over the next year or two that are right near the HRCs? Um, we got county funding for uh, a life on state um, catalytic site is what we're calling it. So. 6th South to 9th South is going to um, um, get a huge facelift. Um, I know that uh, and we're also partnering with the RDA on that to you know, further um, enhance that. So that's something that um, could move forward as early as uh, the 2020 construction season. Um, and then uh, 3rd West is on the list for um, with the street spawn for reconstruction, um, basically from downtown all the way to the, the city line. And um, I, I think we're all painfully aware of uh, the Third West needs more than just a, a facelift, um, and it's going to. We're we're planning on getting doing a complete makeover on that one, and that's actually we just um, an engineering is taking the lead on that. We're working closely with them, so that um, not only will the pavement be improved, but uh, it'll be better for um, the four blocks where we have the bus stops. Um, from between 13th and 17th, and then um, vastly improve the experience for walking and biking as well for the, the length of the corridor. So, right. And the RFP for design is out on that right now for Third West. Well, it's exciting. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much. Um, okay. So, the next, uh, I, I'm going to rearrange the agenda a Mr. little Chair. bit. Oh, yes. 
Uh, just a technical note for the council. Yes. We will work with the administration to get an updated addendum based on the changes to the budget and the contingency amounts that were straw polled today. Perfect. It currently lists the full budget amount, so we'll want to bring that down to reflect the 20 the instead 20%. of 40% contingency. Okay. And then the remaining budget that the council just discussed, we would want to add to a budget amendment or hold and wait for the recommendations from the administration. Great. Thank you. Um, okay, so last time, so when I was chair before, I developed a reputation of being not very friendly towards um, breaks that we had listed on the agenda. Um, so unfortunately, um, I guess I'm gonna continue that. My request to my colleagues is that we ignore the tentative break that we had scheduled since we started late. Um, and readjust the agenda to now deal with um, or interview the board appointees um, that we have listed. We would then follow that um, by the uh, rezone of 545 and 555 West 5th North, um, and then our legislative update. Does that work with everybody? Yes, okay. Sir. All right. Um, so item number seven. Uh, on our agenda is a board appointment for the Community Development and Capital Improvement Programs Advisory Board, Heidi Steed. Is Heidi here? She is. Heidi? Welcome, Heidi. You can, you can pick any seat and any microphone. All right. I'll pick this, this middle one. Okay, well, thank you for your willingness to serve. Um, if you can just tell the council you know, your name and what your interest is in the CDCIP board. Okay, yes, hi, I'm Heidi Steed. Um, I'm a District 1 resident, a uh, lifelong District 1 resident, so uh, born and raised here in Salt Lake City. Um, very active in my community. I love living in Salt Lake City. Um, and I think that this uh, CIP board uh, is going to be a great opportunity for me to really um, dig in and learn a lot about how the city functions and uh, the processes for improving uh, things in our city, improving the quality of life of the citizens of Salt Lake City. Um, I've had the opportunity to go to a few of the meetings um, and watch uh, some of the discussions, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to that. So. Great, thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you. Questions uh, for Ms. Steed? Not a question, more of a comment. She's going to be fantastic. Oh, so. why, why, thank you. I'll run into you in the grocery store. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Well, you're welcome. So the way that this is going to move forward and to the other uh, board appointees, uh, this, this pertains to you all as well. Um, we will, you're, you're on the consent agenda uh, for our formal meeting. You don't need to stay. You're welcome to, if you'd like. Uh, it's the end of our formal <laughs> meeting. Um, but we, we thank you for your willingness to uh, serve on this committee. Yeah. Thank you all for your right. time. Uh, the next is a board appointment for Parks, Natural Lands, Urban Forestry, and Trails Advisory Board, Samantha Finch. Hello, Ms. Finch. Hello. Good evening. Um, again, just to introduce yourself and tell us why you're interested in serving on the peanut board. Um, name is Samantha Finch from District 7, Amy Fowler's district. Good evening, Amy. Hi, good. Um, interested in the board because of uh, just a uh, long interest of mine um, in land use, zoning, planning, and uh, open spaces. Um, and I consider myself an outdoor recreationalist, use the trails and the p local parks within the city. Um, take an interest in how their viability, um, interested in capital improvements. Uh, and I, um, I went, I'm, by training, I'm an, an attorney, like Amy, I uh, went to law school, and actually a, a big reason that brought me to law school was land use, open spaces, um, and uh, just um, how, how the public uses the land and sets aside land for green spaces. So. Um, yeah, land use was a big draw of mine, always an interest. And um, when I saw this opening on the board, I applied, just thought it would suit my interests. And I have a, sh a bit of an educational background. I'd like to actually put some of my educational uh, background training in this field and apply it uh, to my community. It really was my interest. Great, thank you. Any uh, questions or comments? 
Uh, Council Member Fowler. I just want to say, Samantha, that was really loud. I didn't want to say that, but I hope that congratulations. I think this is great, and I'm really excited to see you involved um, still, and you always have been, and I appreciate it. So thanks for, for doing this. I think it's going to be awesome. Well, thank you. I appreciate your support. Council Member Mendenhall. Yeah, it's good to see you again, and I want to thank you um, for finding a way to become engaged in the boards and commissions in the city where this is one of my favorite parts of council meetings is meeting our residents who are willing to volunteer their time and expertise to help the city advance and I'll say quite frankly there's not many people who run a campaign and then decide to find another way to get engaged we don't see many candidates past candidates up here so I appreciate that I appreciate opportunities so wherever they are big or small thank you thank you Uh, our next uh, board appointment is for also the, the peanut board, Jenny Hewson. Hello. Hello, Jenny. So you know the drill now. I do. Actually, I benefit, right, from having seen the last two. So I, um, for the last 15 plus years, I've been working on international land management, sustainability issues, and climate change. And I would like to do something that is more local uh, to balance out my, what I do internationally. I use the trail system extensively and have a, a vested interest in open lands and parks, et cetera. So I thought it would be a nice opportunity. Great. Uh, questions or comments? Councilmember Mendenhall. I'm just curious if you could tell us a little bit more about your work that is uh, that dovetails with this kind of volunteerism. Yeah, so I, my background's in remote sensing, so I interpret satellite imagery, and I work with countries to help them monitor their forests um, in terms of sustainability, in terms of deforestation, etc. And I engage a lot with ministries, uh, so I'm used to working with a whole broad spectrum of people and kind of balancing different ideas. And every time my flight lands back in Salt Lake, I head to the trails. So I have a vested interest in, in what happens in my local community. Thanks for being willing to work here too. All right. Yes, thank you. All right, so you will be on the consent agenda uh, in our formal meeting tonight as well. So okay. thank you for your willingness to serve. All right, thank you. Right. So we will now, um, Go back to number six on our agenda, which is our request to rezone of 545 and 555 West, 500 North. Uh, Nick Tarbot is going to introduce this um, topic, and he is joined by Michaela Okte or Michaela Okte and Kachi Pace from Plan. So, Council Members, <clears throat> this may be one that you've heard of a couple times since 2012, right? Um, what, what we have here tonight is a request um, that the council had approved a rezone back in 2012 to rezone the properties at 545, 555 West from SR1A and SR3 to TSA and that the rear of the parcels at 555 West, 500 North from SR1A to SR3. The council had, had approved the rezone subject to the applicant, um, subject to a condition that the applicant would dedicate the private street to the city eventually when they completed construction of it. At the time, the applicant was okay with it. They thought that would be long-term beneficial for them, so they agreed to it. Since then, there's been four extensions granted, and the applicant has requested that, and this was last year, the applicant requested that that condition be removed. Um, they're finding it difficult over the last couple of years to, do, to move forward on the project, and just having to come back every couple of years takes a lot of the time from them and from the council. And so staff is recommending, or so last year, I should also explain, um, we thought that we could work this out through a development agreement. Um, we had that good idea here at the table, but then the attorneys told us that it doesn't work that easily. So we've since learned the development agreement's not gonna work, and so the council has the option to either continue extending the, resolu the resolutions for this ordinance, 
or to remove the condition, which is what the applicant is asking for. So staff's recommendation is there's been other similar rezones in the past where we, the council's approved a rezone but not required the street to be um, brought up to city standards and dedicated to the city. So staff is recommending that that condition be removed and just go back to what the planning commission's recommendation was, which had a few conditions on it. So Mr. Chair. Okay, Council Member Rogers. I guess I'm looking at options for consideration. Then staff is recommending option number one. Yeah. And that is to go, like I said, to go back to what the Planning Commission had recommended with their conditions. Uh, thank you. I know that this is, I think it's the fourth time it's come in my short time with the council. So uh, I'm ready to move on with it. So, and, and, and do the referral from the staff. So thanks. Okay. Other comments or questions? Is the applicant here? Yes. Uh, does the applicant wish to speak? Okay. All right. If there are no other, uh, oh, Council Member Johnson. Council Member Johnson keeps waiting until the last possible minute until the discuss Wait, until I'm you, ready to move on. You literally looked like this. Any questions? And you went right there. <laughs> <laughs> Every deliberative body here. Uh, a question about if the the street remains private, the utilities under the street. So. One of the comments from public utilities back when this was being presented um, as a plan development was that the utilities be uh, replaced, both water and sewer. So I, my understanding is that that um, requirement would still be applicable even if the, 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 the road is still private. So they would be responsible to replace the sewer water. It would still be private line though, running from the, from was it, uh, the six? I forget what, what north was, fifth, fifth north. Hi, I'm just gonna um, bop in and say that it's the, uh, my name's Margaret Paul, and I represent the applicant in this case. And um, it is uh, the property owner's desire to still dedicate the street. Um, it takes a lot of uh, money and investment to construct the new sewer main and the new water main and all of the laterals, et cetera, and uh, as well as install the pedestrian access the storm drain, the curb and gutter, mm -hmm. and um, and so it's the property owner's intention to, uh, when they record the plat, to have that street dedicated for public use. Um, the the hiccup in the condition on the rezoning was the time frame, and the, and so that's why um, Council Member Rogers has you know, talked about seeing us four times because, you know, we just haven't had the, um, the time to get all the construction drawings, et cetera, and the subdivision prepared. Mm -hmm. um, the planning commission, the preliminary plat approval and the plan development approval that were originally um, applied for and granted in 2012 have expired. So the applicant will be required to go back through that entire process. Um, and this uh, request simply saves them the burden of adding the zoning again to that, to that re, mm -hmm. um, you know, reconsideration of the original plans. Yeah, my, my concern is simply that we ran into in my district a, a circle that had a water main leak or break. None of the residents realized it was a private line because years and years back, whatever right. the agreement had been, nobody was aware of it, and therefore they were on the line. Yeah. The city was on the line, um, and the sewer was city. The water was, well, the sewer was private. The water was city. And so my concern is making sure that it's coherent, yeah. it's clear. Yeah. Um, when this body is no longer here, perhaps. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah, those professionals at public utilities won't let you get away with that. Yeah. Okay. 
Well, that's all my concern, so thank you very much. Council Member Wharton. Um, I just was very close to moving into one of the houses on, or on Tuttle Court once, and I think, so I've seen the work that you guys are doing, and I think that it's really has so much potential, and it's just a really cute little gem in that area of the neighborhood. So thanks for what you're doing, and I wish you the best of luck um, going forward. Us. Yes, you're welcome. And you have some really nice residents. Okay, uh, seeing no, for, no further questions or comments, thank you all. Thank you uh, very much for being here. And So this will be on for the 19th for final consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we are now at number 10 on our agenda, which is our state legislative briefing. David Litvak um, is here. Mary Beth is going to be here as well. Lynn Pace, I saw. Uh, so he'll make his way up, I'm sure. Okay, while, while we're waiting for Lynn, since we're all about efficiency here, um, I'm gonna turn the time over to our council executive director, uh, Cindy Guest Jensen, to talk about council announcements. Oh, now there's Lynn. Oh, that's okay, now Lynn can wait. Oh, well, okay. <laughs> Sorry. All right, so the, um, you have on your agenda a grant public hearing for this evening, and there are three um, potential grants that relate to uh, bike share expansion, and they are all tied to Green Bike. A couple of council members have asked staff, um, with all of the movement movement, huh, sorry, uh, happening with bicycles, scooters, that type of a thing, whether it would be uh, timely for the council to have a discussion or to receive some information from the administration about this topic. The total um, match amount is $80,000. So one idea that staff came up with is um, just to ask the count, the administration if they would uh, come back with a briefing um, uh, and then, um, you know, the council could also put a con condition on that no more than 25000 be spent in match uh, for this topic until the council's had the opportunity to get a better understanding. And I see that that's been removed from my list here, but is the 20, 25,000 thing still part of it? I think based on the conversation with the chair and vice chair today, the discussion was to at least wait and have a fuller discussion and briefing about all three grants and then decide what okay. action the council wanted to take at that time. So it may or may not. Okay. So the question is, would you like to have a briefing on this topic? Yes. All right. Then um, the council working. Mm -hmm. Would our delay of this, as it has been teed up, um, be a delay in Green Bike receiving the funds that they? The, um, the grants don't stop. I mean, the, the application takes place and then they're processed normally. So this is a notice to you guys. Uh, as the legislative body, it's, it isn't an approval to move forward, but because there is match money involved, there, you know, there is a role for you on this one. So... Find out more about yeah, what we, the impact okay. would be to the grant funds and any plans. Because, Mr. Chair, my concern isn't about give it, getting Green Bike the grant. It's about us having a better understanding of how advancing ordinances that allow other bike share systems to flourish in the city while they may actually be undermining the very thing we've invested <coughs> public dollars in for almost 10 years to build, um, that's a conversation I want to have. So I don't mean to slow down Green Bikes funding. So I mean, essentially, sorry. Yeah, no, like we could vote on grant on, on the grant and have, because they almost seem like two different, um, it's not that we don't wanna give them the money, it's that we need to understand how the ordinance is going to work. So it seems like we could probably go forward, right? And 
approve the money but still have a briefing on the ordinances and have Green Bike come in and have some of those briefings even afterwards so that we're not slowing down the money. Right? Yeah. I mean, I think I... <laughs> Uh, Mr. Yeah. Chair, I, I think that's my whole point is that we need to have that conversation before we approve that. I mean that you look at the technology and how it's come forward, you know, you see Lime now doing electric bikes and how is that disruptive technology affecting green bike and is it really appropriate funds for us to be looking at that? I'd love to have Lime actually come in and talk to us as well. So it, for me it's a bigger it's a bigger picture for us to be looking at. And I appreciate Councilmember Rogers um, getting my thought back on track because <laughs> <laughs> that is exactly, I mean, that is one of the things that I'm also um, really curious about as well because I do think that um, with the addition of Lime and Bird not, you know, doing the scooters, now with Lime doing the bicycles as well, um, there we just need to figure out how to make all of this work together. Um, and. I would be I would be somewhat reluctant just to give money because we're nice, um, you know, without having without having a, a broader discussion about you know how it's going to integrate with everything else that's being done. I would agree. I, I just functionally speaking, I found the dockless is much easier on last first mile, last mile than the bike stations, especially if the point is to expand it to other parts of the city. It probably doesn't meet as great a need in my neighborhood as a dockless concept would be. I'm not opposed to green bikes. I would love to see it still evolve. Um, and our investment, I think, is a good idea in certain areas. But I think we need to be targeted in where those areas are and how they best function. I, I agree, Councilmember. And I, I think, you know, looking at your district, uh, my district, and um, Councilmember Rogers' districts are the, are the three districts that probably. I mean, well, I don't see, you know, the addition of, um, you know, the, the docked bikes anytime soon. So um, I do think that's why I just want to have a, a more thorough conversation before we start giving money or, or granting money away. Can I? Council Member Mendenhall. If you, um, if any of you, my peers, haven't met with Green Bike recently about this, I encourage you to. And they, I think what I'm hearing is that this, um, there's curiosity about dockless, there's interest in electric, and I'm hearing Green Bike say, we're interested in exploring whatever it is that the city wants us to explore and that their board wants to explore. But fundamentally, that's a nonprofit organization that we've invested in for almost a decade that has a really different purpose than the venture capital enterprises that are on our streets today. And I don't think that we should be drawing a red line through Green Bike to say, we really, you know, that's a model that's outdated because they're willing to evolve. And that's a, their, their, the mission of that as a nonprofit is so different from what we've seen play out with the venture capital models around the country. So. Well, and, and while, you know, I personally am happy to meet with them and, and, and I'm willing to do that, I'm more curious about what their ideas are to evolve instead of whether or not we want them to evolve. Um, part of, you know, that's, that's kind of what we need to, <coughs> What I, I'm going to be looking for from them is what their ideas are, how they, you know, how they want to stay or plan to stay relevant. If they want to expand into dockless, um, you know, how that's going to work. I'm, I'm more than open to doing that. Um, what I'm concerned about, though, is without that information, uh, granting money to a system that, that, you know, may not be obsolete, but is certainly going in that direction with the addition of, of these other services. So I, I think the I think the responsibility, frankly, is on Green Bike uh, to approach us uh, with with ideas on, on how they're going to innovate, as, as opposed to us asking them to do so. Other questions on this? Okay, Cindy. And I'll just point out that fortunately we had listed this actually as an item on our public agenda, so that's why it was possible to have that much of a discussion on. Um, an announcement item. So thank you to the staff who thought ahead to list that. Okay, council working groups. Um, we have a number of working groups right now. It's not like they're subcommittees, but it's just groups that that have um, kind of um, organically formed or offshoots of, of the legislative subcommittee. Um, we have um, 
we have the housing working group that this is just very um, kind of what we've heard from council members and what the council chair has um, suggested originally the let's see we have Amy as the RDA chair on this I'll just skip to that and then <clears throat> Uh, we had the uh, council chair was chair. on there, yeah. um, but we've replaced the council chair with the RDA vice chair. Okay, and then the other thought was um, Council Member Johnston, based on his subject matter expertise of the um, Housing Commission and that type of thing. So really, all seven of you could be on all of these, but then it would be the whole council and not a working group. <laughs> so it's really hard to get figured out um, who to invite when. So we want to come back to you and ask you for your feedback on whether we're going in the right direction. Okay, the legislative subcommittee, um, every year we have a, a feedback from council members that it gets a little tricky uh, when we, we have under our policy that the um, the former chair continues through April or through the end of the legislative session and that is for continuity purposes so that um, that person who has been working uh, throughout the summer and fall and winter uh, still has the um, knowledge base the the group can take advantage of that person's knowledge base and the contacts and that type of a thing um, but at the same time uh, it seems like we need the council chair. And so that was, that's been a struggle for a few years. And so the one idea is to um, slightly alter it and have the current council chair, the current RDA chair, and the immediate past council chair. So that you're, you're solving that problem of your chair, the chair problem. <laughs> uh, so, so we can give you that as food for thought. It's not anything that would start anytime soon. It's just for you to think about. And you may come up with, you know, four or five other different ideas. But um, it does seem very difficult to have um, the mix of a former chair and not a current chair. It doesn't matter right now because we have both. Um, anyway. Then the Mill Creek Working Group. Oh, Cindy, I just had a suggestion. Okay. Um, that if the, let's see, the immediate past council chair is, uh, does not seek re-election that year for some strange re reason, like with Luke Garrett when he was oh, sure. chair, what if the vice chair then took yeah. that, that spot? Yeah. That's just in case that something does pop up like that. Yeah, if they didn't seek re-election or were not, ele not re-elected. Okay. Okay, so, so we would bring that back to you, but in the meantime, if you have ideas that you want to suggest, then we'll write those up as, as options. Um, then it looks like a Mill Creek Working Group has formed uh, based upon necessity. We have um, the council chair, the council vice chair, and the district seven representative, although in I don't know if it's the council chair or if it's the, I mean, council vice chair, or if at some points it's um, also, <coughs> I don't know. I'm confused. Cindy, my, yes. my thought on this one is that we, on, on this one in particular, it'd be flexible uh, because, um, you know, again, having a working group with three is important. Um, this is a fairly, a uh, complex issue just because of the the timing of it and so there there may have to be you know some movement but you know so that uh, council member Mendenhall who serves on the U, uh, Utah League of Cities and Towns board uh, would also be included and so there may have to be you know some meetings where um, you know we we move that group around but but I think that the uh, yeah in general you've caught the, the staff has caught the idea of what we've what we're looking for 
Okay. Does that work? With yeah. So while you're everybody? along talking along those lines, one thing that occasionally happens is that you may have two members of one of these um, subgroups that aren't available, and it seems relevant in a lot of cases to check to see if any other council members are available to participate <coughs> in a meeting. A good example is uh, tomorrow. There's a meeting that. Um, just one council member was able to attend. Now it looks like one other would be available. May we have permission of the group to reach out to other council members when the regular, um, th those regularly in attendance at the group Definitely. aren't able? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and it, can I say one more thing about the Mill Creek Working Group? Um, this one, uh, we're all hands on deck on this right now. I mean, I think, you know, every, you're all, everyone's gonna be involved in this one because it is, it is that big of a deal. So um, everyone's gonna be looped in um, on this as this moves forward in the next few weeks. Okay. And then uh, the final one that we have here is the Inland Port Working Group. And um, that would be the chair, the vice chair, who also happens to be an Inland Port board member, and then our uh, immediate past chair, who has um, been through all of the uh, issues with the legislators for the past year. So um, then the other thing I wanted to ask you is, it seems like there are times when we need a subject matter expert as staff, and like, it seems like, well, it would be relevant to invite so-and-so because he or she happens to know about um, the justice system or any number of things, clean air, whatever, maybe there's a water specialist or something. And as long as those folks that are subject matter experts don't have a conflict of interest, it, it's been relevant for us to just pull them in uh, so you may have the chair and vice chair or the RDA chair and the council chair and then a subject matter expert. So we've done that a little bit um, and I think it would be really nice for us as staff if we could just work with each of you to, to think about um, your subject matter expertise so that we do have a good list to draw from as these um, unusual topics come up. And Cindy, I, I think it's important that we all remember that these groups are fluid. Um, it, adding, adding names to it at least gives some predictability to staff and the administration. So, you know, if there are issues that come up, um, you know, they know who, you know, generally to, to be looking at, but they're fluid. So it's not like, hey, if you're not on one of these groups, then, you know, you're not going to know what's going on. That's, it, it's just, we needed to have some predictability, but understanding that we need all of us to do this, so. May I ask a question? I assume the, the legislative subcommittee, the housing working group potentially, and the inland port working group will last more than the year. Safe assumption? They seem to be long-term issues that aren't, are changing enough and have those impacts. I, so personally, I agree. I think that, you know, that is, is probably, legislative maybe not, but, um, you know, I think the housing working group, the inland port working group, there, there probably is, is some importance of keeping that continuity. But as we always are reminded by our staff, we can't bind a future council. Um, so, you know, I think while it's, it's safe for us to have that, you know, that understanding that, you know, these, these groups may extend, but it has to be, you know, the discretion, I think, of, you know, whoever the chair is and whatever the council makeup is at the time. But, but I, you're absolutely right. I mean, you know, there, there has to be some predictability on it. I, legislative has survived multiple councils now and likely will survive multiple councils, all things considered. Um, my question, though, is the workload for certain individuals in certain leadership positions that go above and beyond their existing workload. So if you choose to be a chair or vice chair of either RDA or the council, you're taking on a lot anyway, right? And based on our concept here, you're taking on these also. Is that tenable? I know for those who are probably talking about it now, perhaps you've said yes. Uh, I bless you all for that. But is it tenable to take that workload on in these, because it's multiple, I know you're saying about what's a shared workload, but realistically, 
the expertise, expectation is once you get in here and you get the, expert, the experience, the knowledge base, the connections, part of the reason we have these people on here is because of that happened last year. You have the connections with the vice past chair and the yeah. current chairs. Mm -hmm. So I think that in, in this case, we, you know, we, we have to play the hand that we're dealt. Um, you know, these, you know, this group, you know, because of whatever the makeup, the expertise, the relationships, um, yeah, you know, that's just something that I think, you know, we're going to, if, if we're on that group, we have to figure it out. You know, we just have to, you know, leadership is one of those things where, you know, all of us who, you know, serve in leadership, um, have chosen to do that. So, you know, I, the, the workload is real. Um, it's, it's, you know, as council member Mendenhall can attest, I mean, there's, there's a lot that goes into it, but we put ourselves up to that one. Um, so I, that one I'm less concerned about than, but I, your point is absolutely valid on these working groups. Um, I just don't know how we get around. Okay. I, I just put that, that up there because I understand the rationale. We've talked through this yeah. multiple times, um, on to the legislative subcommittee, the expert expectation is you're a voting member of the LPC to some extent. Yeah. And there's a commitment inherent to that to show up to the meetings, those kind of things. It's not the same level as Councilmember Mendenhall being on the board, um, but there's an external commitment to that, the same as Mr. Rogers on the Inland Port Board has. So just I keep that as an awareness piece that when we're putting these, we're putting people on here because of your experience, right, expertise, but also because of the position you've taken on. But if that position is one of those reasons you continue on, it does put a significant burden on future leadership to some extent. So. Sorry that that took yep. so long. Nope. Please just give us your feedback. We're just trying to Sorry. write down what we think we're supposed to be doing. Great. <laughs> Thank you, Cindy. All right. Now we're back to the legislative uh, update. So uh, David Litvak, Lynn Pace, and our wonderful budget finance. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, uh, I just need to alert you to the fact that I have an obligation at seven in Sandy. Yeah. So I have about 15 minutes. If you want to take whatever. more than 15 minutes, that's too much time. Okay, so. good. So I just want whatever it is you want. You from are me. good. That, I love the fact that you have a commitment. Right, good. <laughs> we will make sure he has a commitment 15 minutes after. Anyway, um, to that end, I guess what I'd like to do is 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 first to say what, what's on your mind, what do you want to talk about? I could, I could give you an update, but I can do that via email. So let's get to your questions first. <laughs> it's been a relatively if quiet you, start of the session, you, you not, mean, not a lot going you on. You mean what do we want to discuss publicly? Yeah. Um, that's a good, that is the question. Um, I would say at this point, tell, so the, the legislation that, um, that you're all following right now, tell, tell us a little bit about those things. Well, the, what, what I would uh, direct your attention to is, and the list I've got in front of me is a list of our priorities. Um, and I'd sort of, I can give you an update on all of those. Uh, the water bills, only one of those bills has moved. It's uh, the Senate bill, uh, extraterritorial jurisdiction has moved out of committee. It's now on the Senate floor. Um, not a lot more has happened on those bills. We, we are still relatively optimistic that those three bills will move forward unchanged, which is our hope. Uh, sales tax, there is lots and lots of discussion about sales tax and the possibility of restructuring sales tax, which would involve some, some portion of broadening the base, some element of reducing the rate, and perhaps some element of a tax cut, either in income tax or sales tax. No one knows where that will end up yet. The House is working on it. They don't ha even have a proposal yet, although they've said they'll have one by the end of the week. Um, and who's, who's Representative Spendlove discussion. and Representative Quinn are leading that effort. Um, now, related to that, but I, I would say secondary to that is a discussion about altering the current sales tax distribution model. Uh, Representative Schultz is leading that dialogue. Uh, but as I have said many times, I don't know how you can have any conversation about how to divide the pie differently until you know what the pie is. And so what I keep saying to people is, after you decide how much you're going to expand the base, who's in, who's out, how much you're going to reduce the rate, how much of a tax cut you're going to give, when you're through with all of that, let us know, and then we can start to, to talk about distribution. So, so good luck with the budget, Mary Beth. <laughs> so 
Um, but that's where things are today. It is very fluid, but it, it is a, it's not just something we're watching. It is a real, I mean, it's a real issue. And depending on who you talk to among the legislators, it's either um, an issue they're going to talk about or an issue they're determined to push across the finish line. Um, and I get different opinions depending on who you speak to on a one day. So, um, jumping forward, uh, housing affordability, there's, yes. Before, um, before you move forward, so have you talked on the, on the sales tax distribution piece, have you or our legislative, the city's legislative team met with the chamber? Um, yes. Okay. How have those discussions gone? Discussions have gone very well. They acknowledge that there is, um, that this is a difficult issue to get our arms around this session. And we've said, good, why don't you share with us the message that it can't be done and we need an interim <coughs> study to talk about it. They've been uh, unwilling to do that. They've been what? Unwilling to do that. Okay. Uh, Councilmember Wharton. Um, I, um, sorry. I don't have a question. Oh. I don't know why my mic was on. Oh, that's okay. But then I um, was like, should I take the opportunity? And yeah, you're, an, you're an attorney. Don't, it, I, yeah, I thought that's what you I guys mean, do. I mean, yeah, like I don't usually turn down the opportunity. And I, actually, I really would like in the interest of time, if we could just jump to HB 262, because I would like to hear anything that you can tell me. Okay, we can do that. Um, House Bill 262 is uh, a relative, uh, relatively obscure bill. It just came out yesterday and it's hardly gathered any attention. But um, it is a bill proposed by Representative Potter that would deal with the, a boundary adjustment or rather the annexation of a substantially isolated peninsula uh, of territory that, um, that essentially looks like a definition crafted to describe the brickyard without naming it by name. Does that make sense? Um, the bill just came out yesterday and it has been obviously, it's created lots and lots of chatter here and uh, on Capitol Hill. Um, uh, lots of people wondering what's behind it, what's motivating it, what they're thinking and how we reach a solution. I, there have been multiple meetings that have occurred today, some of which our city staff and council members have been, been involved in. Um, but right now it's just a lot of dialogue unless you have more specific questions. No, the only formal movement, I mean, there was, there was dialogue last week. The formal movement was the introduction of the bill yesterday. And to be clear, the formal movement can happen quickly, right? I mean, it yes. could be assigned to a It could pop up on an agenda right. this week, right? It could pop up on an, ag on an agenda probably tonight. not tonight because <laughs> well, what it, what it would do, so it's in rules time. right now. So rules would send it to one of the subcommittees or one of the committees. The committee would then put it up, but they could put it up for, you know, the, with 24 hours notice. That's it. So have we been um, actively engaging with all of the Salt Lake City lawmakers on this? The Salt Lake, they are aware of it. I can tell you the Salt Lake City lawmakers are not the problem. Right, so. right. Um, okay. Um, are there any other groups other than League of Cities and Towns that would be interested in this, the impacts of legislation like this? Um, there are lots of other cities um, there are, um, but, I, but I think generally speaking, this, this, to most people, this is a private squabble among a couple of, a, a couple of relatives and it's amusing for them to watch, but they have no, no dog in the fight but, and no stake in the outcome. Uh, right, but they're going to vote on it. So, um, well, I'm just, I'm, I thought you were talking about interest groups. Yes, every legislator will have to vote on it, oh, but most interest yeah. groups, is there any other, other interest group out there that will weigh in on this? Probably not, because the annexation of territory uh, or the change of boundaries does not automatically affect any school districts or service providers, so it, it doesn't affect them. And the, da the danger with that is it seems to be very, very specific, but it 
opens the door and creates a terrible precedent for another city to aggressively go after mm. um, a portion of another city, another incorporated city, just because it wants to. And what the legislature is doing with this bill is opening that door so that instead of having um, city to city dialogue, you can have one city go up and, and move forward. But there are, there are huge implications that if, if other cities really, you know, look into what it means that, you know, deal with, you know, bond ratings, um, right. you know, how we, how we bond, what, what bond council, you know, is, is going to do, you know, with the, with the knowledge that boundaries are now fluid, right. um, it has a potential to really wreak havoc with um, the systems of municipal government. R right, I guess, and I understand that. I, I guess uh, my question is more, like you'd think that with that, that many far-reaching consequences that there would be other advocacy groups that might be interested in um, like the ramifications here. And, and do all of the, uh, have we made efforts to inform like all of the residents in this area that, they're, that they would become residents of a different city without their choice? Like have we made that well, the way extra the, effort? I suspect not, the bill just came out yesterday. But the bill is drafted to it so that upon the signature of 50% of the property owners, or I assume, I assume signatures representing 50% of the area, of a substantially isolated peninsula, the property, the, the jurisdictional jurisdiction could then change hands. But Council Member Luke is correct in his assessment of what of the consequences, because if you have a hypothetically, and, and this isn't hypothetical, right? There are there are more there's more than one place where this would apply in the in the state, uh, and even in the city. What that does is it gives the property owners bargaining power essentially to go to the two cities and to say make me a deal who's going to give me the best deal here who's going to give me the best development rights whatever it might be and um, it, they, they create in effect a bidding war between the two cities as to who will give them the most and uh, they sign or don't sign the petition at that point so it 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 creates a lot of problems by opening the door to make boundaries less permanent than they historically have been. Um, but again, the challenge we've got is that there's not a lot of people who care about city boundaries except cities. Thank you. You bet. Other questions? No, we're so excited though. Thank you. Um, there, obviously, I, and I, I don't mean to be cryptic on this, there will be much more to come and there's much more that we are certainly working on, but th th those are those are items that are not really suitable for public discussion because they're um, they're ongoing discussions of possibilities that are not really uh, firm yet. So, Mary Beth, I know you you have sales tax information that you can talk about. Yeah, I just wanted to. Um, so first of all, I want to thank Andrew Andrew Reed who actually did all of this work. Um, we actually took all the paper copies and he actually went to the state tax commission and we have historical data dating back to 2004 all the way through to 2018. So this is good for us because you guys can have the big picture from 2004 through. So I want to thank him because he's worked weekends to get this data so that administration and council can have it. Um, so this first slide is going to show you the um, point of sale number for the fiscal year what Salt Lake City received, what the difference is. That difference is the difference between the 50-50 split, right? So that portion right there, so if we, if we look at 2018, the 23,283,842, that's the portion that is point of sale, right? That is, that is the population portion that actually is going to other communities from Salt Lake City. Um, the percentage of change is the percentage of change in the point of sale difference. So that's year to year difference in change of that. The population is the percentage of population to the state's population. And as you can see, it's decreased significantly from 7.8% down to 6.4%. Um, that's the reason that we continue to have a decrease in 
our population percentage. And just to do a little numbers interpreting, um, if the chart is a little hard to read, I think this is emphasizing that Salt Lake City is more of a commercial center than a residential center, which I think is something we all know. But the trend is that we're becoming more of a commercial center and less of a population center. And so any change in the formula that would take us more to population would, would um, disadvantage us. Or if we change just to point of sale, it would significantly advantage us, as you can see. So, so this is kind of just a graph of that same, that what, we, what I showed you before, because graphs always seem to make it easier for me. So the um, blue portion is the portion that obviously is the portion that we are, that is not a point of sale portion that we're giving away because our population is low compared to the state. And then this is an interesting, um, so basically this is saying from 2004 to 2018, Salt Lake City's population has grown about 8%, but the state's population has grown 32%, which goes to the fact that Jennifer just spoke to is that the state's population is growing faster than Salt Lake City's population, so the state's, um, that 50-50 split is becoming less and less for Salt Lake City as far as population is concerned. We're, we're making more money, but we're getting less compared to the rest of the state. So when people talk about the 1% local um, option, or the 1% that goes to cities, we don't actually keep 1%. We keep something like 0.75, right, of that Or 1%? probably less. Probably the last less. time, I think, was like 0.76. Yeah. So as our population goes down, that number goes down. It's probably about 0.73 now, 0.72. Are other questions um, for Lynn or David? Um, they will be up at the Capitol. So <laughs> um, thank you uh, for doing that. Enjoy your uh, tickets. Thank you. Lynn. Okay. Uh, we will continue to be in touch. All of these issues are obviously very fluid, and so they're changing day to day. But we will, uh, we will, we will keep council staff and probably the council chair informed of developments. Great. Because we have this database now, we can on the fly tell you scenarios. So perfect. That knowing that we ha knowing that we have that tool is yep. really really good. Yeah, he's so amazing. So okay, all right. So with that, we are uh, uh, adjourned until seven o'clock across the hall, where we will reconvene in our formal meeting. <laughs>